and lightness on that side of things. So uh, let's have a warm welcome. Thank you. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, this is my third user group in uh, three nights, so I'm starting to get a little tired. Uh, if I nod off a little bit, just someone come up here and give me a shove. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to talk too much about Couchbase. That's one of the things I'll, I'm going to touch on. But I'm going to talk just about NoSQL in general. And uh, we can dive into some Node if you want to. I have some Nodes, uh, another slide deck with Node. It's really up to you guys what you want to see. But I thought this would, this is a good uh, session just to dive into some of the different types of NoSQL databases out there and, and uh, some of my opinions on the term NoSQL itself. So um, these, are, these slides are based on uh, slides on Matthew Revel, who used to work for Couchbase. I just wanted to give him some credit for that because he did a lot of work for the slide deck. I'm Matt Groves. I'm a developer advocate for Couchbase, which means that I just try to go out and work with developers and get them to maybe try uh, Couchbase and get some feedback from them about the product and uh, what they think is good and bad and I try to help answer questions in the forums and things like that. So that's really my, my job. I'm on Twitter there. I have a podcast and a blog, my own personal uh, podcast and blog. If any of you guys are interested in doing a podcast episode with me on any topic at all, I would love to have you on. Just, just go to the website and, uh, well, any technical topic, I should say. Um, just uh, let me know. I'd love to have you as a guest there. You don't have to be an expert because I'm not an expert either. I'm an enthusiast about uh, technology and, and coding and databases. And so uh, I'm just trying to spread that enthusiasm to you guys, get you to try something new and different. And uh, I, I'm, if you have a really tough question or a really broad question, I may not be able to answer it in a succinct fashion or I may not be able to answer it at all. But feel free to raise your hand and, and stop me at any time to ask a question, and um, I'll do my best to get it answered for you one way or the other. If any of you guys are on Twitter, please use the hashtag Couchbase. If you tweet a picture of something or something interesting you've learned, just so my boss knows I'm not here screwing around. Um, I would bribe you with stickers, but all the greedy Austin devs took uh, just about all of them. I've got like four left, so um, I'd like to put one with this cool little sticker collection here. But uh, anyway. Um, hashtag Couchbase. Uh, before you guys ask, because I'm sure it's on at least one person's mind, is that uh, often Couchbase and CouchDB are mistaken and confused for each other. It's because that they share the same acronym, the same Couch acronym there. Um, but they're not the same thing. They're not a fork of each one another or anything like that. They're both NoSQL databases. They both share an acronym. Uh, they both have some contributors early on to both products that contributed to both, but they're not uh, related any other way. CouchDB is Apache Foundation, and Couchbase is Couchbase Incorporated. All right. So we're going to talk about NoSQL, but first let's talk about SQL, because that's the norm, right? So kind of cut off there at the top. <laughs> We've always been doing SQL, right? Anything else must be an aberration. Any, uh, does anyone here ever share that point of view, maybe even just uh, subconsciously? Well, I'm not so sure that's the case. If we want to get really pedantic about it, we can go all the way back to the invention of writing in Mesopotamia. It's a primitive database, right? Um, Way to the printing press. But the first commercial computer database was created in 1960. It was called the IBM Sabre. And it was uh, created by American Airlines and IBM uh, as to handle airline ticket bookings a little better than uh, they were doing before. It was not relational, though. It was more like a file system hierarchy. So that was really the first commercial database was a NoSQL database. Uh, and it wasn't until 1970 that uh, my friend E.F. Codd there proposes the relational database model, and he comes up with SQL later on. And then in 1979, the appropriate sacrifices were made to the Dark Forces and Oracle uh, databases released. So maybe around 1990, uh, after SQL Server comes to the market there, Relational databases become the norm. And so we have this period of about 20 to 30 years where we sort of default to sticking things in a side of tables. Um, in 2005, people start looking at old ideas. People are always looking at old ideas because there's nothing new under the sun, right? And uh, we see something there called CouchDB, which was created and actually inspired by something called Lotus Notes. Anybody familiar with Lotus Notes at all? Lotus Notes, also a NoSQL database, uh, kind of. 
So CouchDB was created with that inspiration in mind. And then in 2008, we have something, uh, we have an explosion of NoSQL databases. Uh, Matthew called it the Cambrian explosion of, of NoSQL databases. This was influenced by two big academic papers. I'm sure you guys have probably heard of at least one of these. The uh, Google Big Table paper and the Amazon Dynamo paper. These guys were losing money because they couldn't keep their relational databases online. So Amazon created some distributed, massive, fault-tolerant database system, and they wrote a paper after it called Dynamo. And if you use DynamoDB, that's a version of that Dynamo database. And uh, Google did something similar. So these papers started a lot of open source activity, and we're going to look at some of that today. And then finally in 2010, the heavens open and Couchbase descends to earth like a blessing upon us. Um, disclaimer, I work for Couchbase. <laughs> so if you go to couchbase.com, you'll see in big letters up there, NoSQL database. But I don't like the NoSQL term very much. Um, it's not a very useful term because it tells me what something isn't. So sometimes I bring an actual toaster from my kitchen and, and put it down here and say, my toaster is as much a NoSQL database as any of these other things I'm about to show you because I can operate it fully without using SQL query language. There's no tables. I can store data in it in the form of bread, and I can get data out as the form, in the form of toast. Right? So that's as much a NoSQL database as anything else. So that term is not particularly useful except from a, like a marketing shorthand point of view. Um, so that's why this session is going to sort of dive into a little more detail about specifics of these databases that are categorized as NoSQL in that term. So a lot of people maybe think of NoSQL and they think of different characteristics. So I want to go through some of those and see if we can find something that's maybe a little more accurate than, than just the term NoSQL. So is it easy? It's easy to use. Is that what defines a database as being NoSQL? I would argue that. No, no, not really. If you look at Cassandra, for instance, it's, uh, it's not straightforward, totally easy in many cases. It's uh, sometimes very difficult to do things, uh, especially if you're going against what Cassandra was, was made to do. And that's not the only one, just, a, just an example. So I wouldn't say that every NoSQL database is an easy to use uh, database. Is it the fact that they're scalable? You can scale them vertically um, or horizontally, right? Well, you can scale anything vertically. Well, I don't think this is really true either because <coughs> not all the NoSQL databases are scalable or easily scalable or scale well, even if their creators say that they do, right? So um, I don't think this is the case. Is it the fact that you can run these on commodity hardware? Just rack up another server and attach it to a cluster, and you can do flexible scaling, shrink up and down. I mean, they don't have to do this. You don't have to have commodity hardware from NoSQL database. You could put it on one really beefy server if you want to. You're going to lose some of the benefits, but you could do that. But this is the sort of thing people mention when they talk about uh, NoSQL. Is that rain? Or is that like a jet out there? Um, is, it, is it ACID versus BASE? You guys heard of the ACID versus BASE acronyms? Anybody? Nobody? One person? Two? All right. So, so ACID is the idea that a database is, is those things, atomic, consistent, isolated, durable. And then there's sort of a, um, well, that's kind of a backronym on its, on its own. There's another backronym that came later called BASE um, that the, the creator of the CAP theorem, which we'll talk about some today, he came up with this acronym to describe why no SQL databases. But no, this isn't really the case either. If you look at FoundationDB, anybody heard of, heard of that one? I think Apple bought them a few years ago. There, it's a no SQL database that's fully ACID compliant. So that's not a relevant distinction between no SQL and SQL either. Is it that they are schema-less? They don't have a schema. Yeah, well, maybe. We're getting closer there. This is kind of true, right? It's true that many of them don't enforce a schema on you, um, but that doesn't mean there shouldn't be a schema, right? Um, that your documents that you store or your data that you store doesn't have a schema because it probably should have a consistent schema. It's just that the database isn't necessarily forcing it on you. 
So you as a developer need to impose that schema instead. So we're getting, we're getting closer though. A lot of them share this, uh, the same idea. Is it the fact that they are denormalized? Um, this is probably the closest thing we can find that's common amongst NoSQL databases. A lot of them are uh, you know, not in third normal form. Uh, they don't require any of those sorts of things. So huh, that's a little closer too. So those are some of the things. Anything else that you might think of? We'll talk about NoSQL. Any sort of words that pop into your head? But have I covered just about most of them there? Or? Would they be considered easier to modify the schema or add properties to representational version than to modify? So are you, you're saying that it's easier to modify and easier to shoot yourself in the foot? Is that kind of what you're getting at? Or? Uh, you can add data and the applications won't throw up if the data is not there. Um, okay, so that, uh, that kind of goes back to the easy thing I mentioned earlier and the, and the schema list thing I mentioned earlier. So that's, that's definitely true. I think that's definitely, it's definitely a possibility, especially in some of them where they don't impose really any restrictions on the data, which we'll, we'll see today. Indexing, yeah. indexing of the data or faster. That they do have indexing or that they don't have indexing? They do have it or I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're trying, looking for, trying to think of things that, are common to NoSQL databases. We're trying to get our minds around what NoSQL means. No authentication. Yeah. User authentication. No authentication. Oh, okay. I might have to add a slide for that. Um, I, I don't think that's that's true. Um, it is true in many cases, though. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I think we've seen that. Uh, so, yeah. I think that's, yeah, I think that could definitely be a slide up here. That's hey, it's the it's wild west. Wild west. Go on in, get the data. All right, so I think we've discussed enough of those, those a little bit there. So let's talk about why NoSQL. Anybody here use NoSQL, by the way? A couple, well, actually quite a few. Okay, good, good. So before I get into some details about NoSQL, we, we gotta, we got to consider why. Why should we use NoSQL? Um, so let me just give you a disclaimer here. If you're starting out a new project, don't use NoSQL if you think it's cool or because there's peer pressure, or because you want to put stuff on your resume. Those, that's not a good reason to use NoSQL or any tool, really. A lot of problems are solved and solved well by relational databases, by technology you understand, and that there's good tooling around. That's totally fine. So if you have a problem that's not going to scale massively, if you have a problem that's, that fits nicely into a relational model, where you don't have to worry about impedance mismatch or uh, ORMs and you're comfortable with those, you might as well stay with relational or use relational. That's totally fine. And so just save the road less travel for another time. Just keep NoSQL sort of in the back of your mind, in your back pocket. And like if a problem comes up where it's, oh yeah, NoSQL would be a good fit for this. That's fine. Don't, don't force it, right? Uh, and then don't force the other way as well. So this is the blobfish. Some people call it the ugliest fish in the world. You're not going to get any arguments from me. But this is a picture of the blobfish at surface level. Uh, this is actually a deep sea fish. When it's in its normal, really high pressure environment, it looks more like this. So it's still not going to win any beauty pageants, but it definitely looks more like a fish than the picture on the left. So my point is this, whatever data store you use, you know, make sure it's the right one for the job. There's, there's this term called polyglot persistence, which says that, just like a polyglot developer, you know, be willing to explore different technologies and different data storage systems, that, you know, the right one for the job. So maybe the answer isn't just SQL or just NoSQL, but maybe it's a combination of the two. Might fit together to make uh, the process even easier. Okay. So, uh, for instance, maybe if your app is saving log data, to a relational database, maybe not a, you know, the best place to store log data. Maybe it isn't, isn't the worst place, but a relational database, you could start out by trying that out and storing your log data in a, in a uh, NoSQL database for a while, see how that goes. It's not you know, highly important part of the system. You can just try it out, see how it works for you, see if you like it, and you can always switch back pretty easily. So maybe SQL is right and Norm is happy again. 
But there are some cases where relational isn't a fit. So let's talk about some of those. Kind of broadly speaking here. So uh, scaling can be hard. This is true for any system, really. Vertical scaling is the easiest, like the sandwich here. We can just uh, get a faster server or more RAM, a beefier machine, uh, stack on more pieces of bread and more meat and uh, cheese and lettuce on there. And you're going to feed more people with that, right? But at some point, it becomes impractical. You know, how tall will a sandwich get? For we, you know, we can't feed an entire arena with one sandwich anymore, right? Um, so it might make sense to scale out, scale horizontally, and give everybody a smaller sandwich uh, so everyone uh, can uh, still eat. And um, this is called horizontal scaling. So if you ever tried this with relational databases, anyone ever tried scaling out a relational database beyond? So yeah, <laughs> he's already giving me the look. So maybe I got two words for you, sharding scheme. How do you feel about that? Yeah. I think there's an engine called like partitioning, so you can actually partition the table itself sure. by engine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so SQL Server, for instance, there's a variety of sharding methods out there, uh, vertical range, hash directory. But you still have to worry about things like joining across shards or, uh, de you know, do I denormalize or not? Um, what about rebalancing? What happens if you change the schema? Things like that. So people do this and they get it to work. I just came from a code camp in New York, actually, where they were moving their software from on premise to cloud. And it was a multi-tenant system. And so there was this cool, like, elastic model in Azure. Uh, but because each of their tenants were confined to a single database, the scaling worked pretty easy for them, right? Uh, but if, if, you know, that's it's still difficult to do. And uh, so maybe that's not the best way to do it. If your data is not easily divided, if you didn't design your system with scaling in mind from the beginning, it's going to be tough for you to do it later with, C, with the relational approach. So something to think about. Availability is hard. This is always hard with relational databases. You know, keeping things online, especially for writes. This is where I'm going to touch on the CAP theorem a little bit. Anybody heard of the CAP theorem? CAP? A few of you? Good, good. It's, uh, it's a theorem that states that uh, with, when you have a distributed system, like a distributed database, you have uh, three things. Consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, you can pick two of those things. Now, if you don't pick partition tolerance, then it's really not a distributed system, so you have to pick that one. So really, the idea is you have to switch between consistency and availability. And that, this applies when one of those servers goes down or if there's a network split. If everything's running as normal, you get all of those things. But if something bad happens, then that's where the cap theorem comes into play, and we have to start talking about trade-offs. So that's cap theorem. But the idea here is that, you know, if the first Pepsi tap runs out, I can go to another Pepsi tap and, and keep going from there. If there's only one Pepsi tap, then it goes, it runs out of syrup and we're done. No more Pepsi. Except uh, instead of Pepsi, it's, uh, it's data. Schemas can be hard. Something simple like this may not be so bad, right? But uh, something more complex is very, very difficult. Coming up with them in the first place. And, you know, you have to define all those up front and maintain them across the lifetime of your app. Uh, are you ever tried to take a, you know, have, had to take a database offline to do a schema change? Uh, in some cases, that's just not acceptable to take your system down for some period of time while you make changes to it. Uh, to tell a user they can't purchase from you because you're changing the structure of your tables. So those are some of the things that broadly, NoSQL can help you with. So when we're talking about NoSQL, these are sort of the four different categories of NoSQL that are, are kind of popular. There are other kinds as well, which I'm not going to cover tonight. Um, these are the ones that open source people seem to be most interested in. And you'll likely encounter these in your research. Uh, graph, I don't know how much time I have tonight, but if we don't have time, I'll, I'll probably just skip graph, it's kind of the odd one out, but it is very cool though. The other thing I want to mention is convergence. So as NoSQL databases get more mature, and as people's interest in NoSQL grows, we're seeing some convergence in the features across the board. So relational databases are starting to add some, you know, JSON data types or XML data types and indexing them. And uh, on the, on, from the other direction, 
Couchbase, for instance, has a SQL query language, which I'm going to show you briefly today. So there is some convergence happening in this market. Document DB from Azure also has a SQL query language, which is pretty cool. Uh, so we're seeing definitely some change in the market, and these things are, are coming together more and more. So it's an exciting time where databases are adapting and changing and converging. I'm going to start with document databases. This is the ones that uh, I'm most interested in as a Couchbase uh, employee. And what I mean by document is basically a, a typically a JSON object or an XML object stored as one piece of data. So if you do some market research, you'll see that these are some of the big names in NoSQL. I also have Lotus Notes down there in the bottom left, if any of you are into that. Um, and uh, the, two, the top two sort of right now is MongoDB. It's the huge, you know, the, far, by far and away the most popular uh, NoSQL database, document database, anything. And then my, my company Couchbase is, is kind of the second place right now in terms of document databases. Those are the most relevant. I'd say that even if they didn't pay my, uh, pay my mortgage. So they're up there. So when we store... Uh, pieces of data that are in a known format like, uh, like JSON in this for in instance here. It's not just a bag that you throw things into, it actually has some structure there. And that structure is typically, we see, this is the most common, so JSON is like Couchbase. Uh, Mongo uses uh, uh, Bison, Bison, however you say it. Um, some of the databases use XML, like MarkLogic. Uh, there might be a YAML database out there. I hope not, but there might be. Uh, but no one likes XML, so we'll drop them off. We're not going to talk about them today. And, uh, and Bison is, is basically just a variation of JSON. So we're really just, I'm just going to focus on talking about JSON uh, document databases today. It's human readable. It's compact compared to XML. And it can have arrays, objects, hierarchies, uh, you know, really rich data structure there. You guys are all familiar with JSON, I'm sure. And like I said, the document can understand the format of the document. So it can do some server-side stuff with that. It's not just a blob of data out there. It can actually reason about what's going on. So normally, you'd have to pull something out, do some operation on it, and then put it back. But if we know it's JSON out there, we can actually do some stuff server-side. We don't have to you know, bring it over and back all the time. So we'll talk about Couchbase as an example of this. Just walk you through some, some basics. This is, most of this is very similar to other document databases like Mongo. In Couchbase, we have the idea of buckets, which are just collections of documents. Um, all kinds of documents can live in a bucket. The only requirement is that each document has a key that's unique in that bucket. Uh, so it's kind of like the equivalent of a namespace, something like that. Documents themselves are kind of like tables, but not really like tables. They're like Rows, but not really like rows either. Views are MapReduce functions that allow you to do some interesting queries. And then Couchbase has this cool thing called uh, Nickel, which is SQL uh, query language plus some extra stuff to deal with JSON. Because SQL is designed for tables, rows, and columns, uh, Nickel needs to be able to handle the extra Java or JSON stuff. So it's a superset of SQL. So let me show you some just really simple code here. This is a CSV file with some inventory of Couchbase swag. T-shirts, stickers, which this is actually down to four now, not 256, um, and so on. There's a code. That's the first column there. There's a title description and a quantity. OK, pretty simple data set there. Uh, here's some C Sharp. If you guys hate C Sharp, that's totally fine. It's not going to be difficult. I'll walk you through it. Um, this is just some C-sharp that pulls in that CSV and puts it into Couchbase documents. So let's look at it one piece at a time here. Just to set up uh, Couchbase, I'm going to set up a client configuration, tell it where the node or nodes are. Since I'm a developer, I have a one node running on this machine. But in production, you could have potentially hundreds of nodes. So you list those there. I initialize that. And then once I have that initialized, I can then get access to a bucket. I've called the bucket very creatively, default. You can call it bucket name, whatever you want to. OK. So now with that bucket, 
I can now load up that stock list. I'll just use a CSV reader, loop through the CSV row by row, uh, get those into a, a C sharp, in this case dynamic C sharp object, and then I'm going to set, create a new document. This is the key, which is that first column, the code, and this is the document itself, a C sharp, C -sharp object, but that will get serialized into JSON in Couchbase. And then I insert the document right, to, right out to console that I inserted it. So yeah, this is a pretty basic 101 sort of level here, but if I run that, I'll end up with this. This is a screenshot of the Couchbase console. <coughs> you can just browse the documents in there. And so there's, it's kind of cut off, but you can see the code there is the first column. And here's the JSON document itself in the value column. And I could click on edit document to get you know, a better view of the formatted JSON there. So on. To get a document back out, I just say bucket.get, pass in the document key, and then I just write out to console what's in the document, which would look like this. Very exciting. So typical document database operations are upsert, which is a combination of insert and update, kind of like a merge, if you're familiar with that. Uh, those are also known as set, add, and replace in some other document databases. Delete, delete a document, and get will get a single document. So these are sort of the most basic operations you can typically see in a document database. Um, you want to do some more interesting stuff, you have to bring in MapReduce, or with Couchbase you can also bring in Nickel instead, which I'll show you in the next slide here. Now this might seem a little basic, but often what we're doing with document databases, as compared to relational databases, is that in relational, you have to sometimes twist your data to fit into the table model. So some discrete piece of information, like an invoice, that might, you have to put that in five different tables, split it up in there you know, to, to normalize it. With a document, you just have one document that contains the invoice. So the invoice name, each item on the invoice, and so on. So that would be all in one single document, as opposed to spread out amongst multiple tables. So these operations are often uh, adequate to interact with data in the same way you would with a relational database. If not, with Couchbase, you have this cool uh, nickel language. These are some, again, very, very 100 level SQL queries here, nickel queries. This is just say, give me all the documents from the default bucket where the uh, ID of the document equals sticker CB logo. Um, I probably want to use the, the get operation instead of that because this is only ever going to return one or zero documents, so it's just for a demonstration. Here's a little more interesting. I can say, give me all the documents where the quantity is greater than 10. So if I have 10 or more stickers, then it'll return the stickers document. Uh, yeah, go back. Do, yeah. do you wind up having to do the equivalent of a table scan to read every document? Yeah, so the question is just to do the equivalent of a table scan to pull every <laughs> document. And so the answer is with Couchbase, I can't speak for any others, I don't know uh, what the deal is, but you can create indexes in Couchbase. Because we know that it's JSON, we can do that server side stuff. I can set up the equivalent of a, a table scan by just saying index all the documents by their primary key. But in this case, I'd probably want to index this quantity field. So that way the query is going to return faster than just doing a full what's called a, what's called index, uh, what's it called? I think it's called a primary scan in NoSQL. So yeah, very rich indexing language. And again, it has to be more specific to JSON. You have dotted notation, because sometimes you're, you're indexing something in the hierarchy or something in an array. Yeah, over here. So actually, this, this uh, I was going to wait to the end, but this question has been hard for me for months now. Uh, uh oh. Excuse me, the, the extreme case. Let's say a social network, I get into this debate all the time with coworkers who okay. are Network, uh, it's a collection or bucket of users, right? Okay. Uh, let's say it's uh, 10 million, 10 million users in there. I have five friends, and in my document, I have you know it says my name and mm -hmm. it says friends, and it's an array of object references to. Okay. And so what I want to know is is that how much is that faster? And if it is faster, how much faster is that than a SQL database where it says uh, you know, I would say where I have to search a table of friends where 
the person has you know, my ID saying, okay, this is, you know, Right. right. Okay, so I think I understand what you're saying. You have a, a, a document that references other documents by, let's say, the key. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. Like an array of other key IDs? Yes, yeah, so not just, I guess, the key, but the actual object reference. So I don't know how object references work. Uh -huh. Like, does that, that weird, you know, UID that I see is that like the actual uh, space in memory that all my goes to? So I don't know uh, across the board the answer, but in Couchbase you'd store a, a key to another document in, 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 in the document itself. Uh, and then you could, for instance, do a join in Nickel here to join one document to other documents. Now a lot of NoSQL databases don't have the concept of a join. Uh, Couchbase does. So if you don't have a join, you'd have to then get that first document and then look at those IDs and then get all those documents as well. Um, and that's going to be, you know, probably at least two operations to do that. And as far as is it faster, I can't really answer that unilaterally. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I would say run a benchmark just to yeah. prove your friends wrong and maybe bet them some, uh, you know, a couple of rounds of drinks beforehand. Uh, and you may want to try Couchbase to win this bet because <laughs> Couchbase has <laughs> Couchbase has a built-in uh, memory cache layer. You don't have to configure, it just it comes with it. And so when you're doing these operations, you're often pulling documents right from RAM and not having to go to disk. Whereas SQL might have to well, lock the table, it might have to go to disk. And um, so hypothetically, I think you could win that bet if you wanted to. But I'm not going to guarantee it. We do have detailed benchmarks at couchbase.com if you want to check those out. I think it's YTSB, is that the right acronym? YCSB? It's industry standard benchmarks, if you want to check those out. Um, I, I think Couchbase is pretty fast because of that building, because of this architecture, because of that building cache layer. So. And just, I guess, the last note on this. Sure. Uh, even right now, we have a, at work, we have uh, a model that has, I would say, 10, 10 relations to it. So all these different tables, and like each of these tables, I would say, like has a million entries. And so whenever we are, the back end, it takes forever to go and query all the data, and uh, that's where we're kind of like, this is where this argument kind of comes from. I see. If anyone can, I guess, shed some light on it afterwards, please. Yeah. No, I, I think, you, I think uh, so it sounds like to me, you might have an indexing issue with your relational database, so that could be part of the problem as well. Uh, or it could just be, maybe you need to ver <laughs> vertically scale, and we can go back to that scaling problem again, where at some point it's going to become impractical or expensive um, as you get bigger and bigger. So. Uh, question back there. Um, this a uh, uh, further question that really relates to this. Sure. Uh, my, I, I think, did you mention anything about the, uh, you said the star strategy or? The star strategy? The, the start. Not oh, start? How you, how you develop your, the buckets or what's your strategy? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, so the question is about how do you develop buckets and come up with a strategy well, to storing I, data? Put, put the thought in mind. If, if he, has a, he has a relationship of him, he has five points. Mm -hmm. uh, how I set up my buckets or how I set up a bucket or how I set up objects in my bucket, I would do that to uh, cheat in a sense. Okay. Where I already have that relationship already done. So when sure. I his his his, his ID, I'm just basically easily go and get his five points that he needed to pull that back and not necessarily go to the 10, 10 million. Road. Gotcha. I got gotcha. you. So, so uh, I, again, I, I can't answer in a narrow sense, but I can say that Couchbase or document databases can support kind of two different strategies in that sense with this relationship. So, in his example of the users, um, it doesn't really make sense to store his friends inside of his user document because they are their own distinct documents as well. But in the case of, say, an invoice, where you have a list of items, quantities, price, those can be denormalized and stored within the document itself. So you'd have one single document that represents an invoice instead of an invoice document and five different items documents, right? So you have the option of both denormalizing and using a referential model by storing those document IDs in there. And uh, the, the way you build your keys as well can also affect this. If you give your keys a little bit of intelligence, you can use those to help 
uh, more easily find related documents. So that's another strategy some people use as well. Yeah. There's a lot of flexibility with data modeling in NoSQL, which is kind of a really cool thing because now you have a lot of power, but it's also kind of, you know, puts more responsibility on you. Well, so the other, so my second part of that. Okay. By adding this level of uh, SQL language to, uh, to the database, aren't you, aren't you adding the complexity back to how you're getting the data? Um, I, I would say that this isn't going to necessarily add complexity to the data. Um, it may add complexity, well, so the alternative then is to go back to like a MapReduce set of functions, which are fine, nothing wrong with those. Um, but if you are, you know, if you use relational your whole life, your whole career, uh, you know SQL. So you come over to NoSQL and you can immediately apply your experience to the existing data in there. You don't have to learn an entirely new paradigm all at once. So I think this kind of helps you get a little adjusted to a NoSQL database. So, I mean, yeah, there's some complexity. You can write a really complex SQL query, for sure. But you don't have to. Over there, sure. So since it's a NoSQL, you should be able to handle unlimited data Right, supposedly. So what will be the ceiling per node to be handled? Because uh, for SQL, we have a similar problem. Its table is like 10, 20 million, and it's slowing down. Mm -hmm. We shard it. Yeah. Uh, we have a 20 million record per table, 32, because it was a MAC address. We sharded by max. And okay. It's horrible. So Cassandra, I countered some documents saying, hey, don't store any more than 100 million per space or some sort. Okay. So what would be the ceiling for the couch space? Okay, so the question is, what is the ceiling per node in couch space? Excuse me. So as a developer with couch space, you don't have to specify the node that the data goes to. You get automatic sharding. So you say to the cluster, store this document. It will form a hashing algorithm on the key and decide which node it goes on. and same way when you're getting a document out, it says, okay, that's, that's on this node, so I'll go there and try to get it. So you don't have to, you know, it, it's going to distribute the data evenly amongst your nodes. And if you're starting to run into uh, a storage limit or, uh, you know, you want to add more RAM to your cache, you can just rack up another node, add that to your cluster, perform what's called a rebalance, and it will spread out the data evenly across those, that cluster again. So, I mean, as a developer, you don't have to think about individual nodes. It's just, you know, go to the uh, console and look at what the capacity is right now of your, you know, what's the total disk space being used. Do I need more? Okay, rack up another server. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. On your C sharp code, you have like uh, some IP address in there. Is that the IP address of the manager of the cluster? Okay. Or is that actually specifying each node separately? Okay, so the question was, is this uh, URL here specifying each node separately? And yes, this is connecting to each node. You, you probably want to list each node in here. You only have to put one node, and it will find the other ones okay. for you. But if something happens and your app restarts and this node is down, then you want to have the other nodes listed there so it can find, it, you know, it's going to stop at the first one it can find, and they get information from there. So the more you have listed, the better. Um, Right, but you, you mentioned if you're rebalancing a cluster of mm -hmm. 20 of these nodes or whatever, yeah. um, in a way you kind of have to have the code sync up with the configuration right, of 20 different IPs or whatever it may be just to make this sort of safe in a way, right? If, right. That, I mean, that's... Is that the best pra practice? Or um, well, I, I don't I'll recommend a best practice on that. So, but the, the thing is... You, when you start, you may have some, well, if I'm understanding your question, you may start with 10 nodes, and you list them all here, all 10. You add another 10 nodes, and you're saying, I have to update my code to add, to add those additional nodes. You don't have to, but if you wanted to be super, super safe, you could. You also have to update the code. You could, you know, I've got this hard coded. You could put it in a configuration file so you don't have to do a recompile or anything like that. Might be a good way to go about it. But as long as it can get Couchbase anyway, as long as it can get one node, it can find the rest of them in the cluster. It can find where that one key that's being hashed is. Yeah, it's, it's, going, it's going to be interacting with what's called the cluster manager. So the SDK will sync up with Couchbase to know where all the nodes are 
and the sort of, uh, it's a hashing algorithm, but a, a key range to where it's going to be able to find individual documents. So you don't have to think about that too much as a developer. Okay. Where was I? Nickel, that's right. Now, uh, this is really the simplest nickel I could show you. I have a lot of the slide deck with some really deep nickel stuff. If you guys want to go into that, um, I'm totally fine. That's up to you guys. Uh, but just to sum up with, uh, with Couchbase specifically, it's great for developers, really easy. Uh, scales quite easily. All you just do is rack up another server and connect it to the cluster. Consistently fast because of that built-in uh, uh, layer of uh, cache, which is pretty cool. Uh, so you'll be reading and writing to RAM and not having to wait on the disk. Document databases in general are good for these types of use cases. And I'd say if I had to pick one to generally replace a relational database, it would be a document database. Uh, I think it has the most sort of flexibility and power if I wanted to do that. Uh, if you go to info.couchbase.com there, we have a white paper with some, uh, I guess they call the top 10 use cases of some of our customers and why they went with us, and why they went with NoSQL. Uh, some of them replaced their SQL databases. Some of them are augmenting it. And so if you want to dive into more detail about the use cases, go there. It's a free white paper. Check it out. So that's document databases. I want to talk about next is called a key value database. And these are similar to document databases in that you have a key and you have a value but the value in this case is more of an opaque blob. It doesn't have to be JSON or XML or BISON. It can be whatever you want it to be. Uh, it doesn't care what the value is, and therefore it can't reason about the value either. It can't do as much server-side stuff. But there are some good use cases for this, and if you are searching around, you'll see a lot of these sorts of uh, logos in this space here. Couchbase can also act as a key value store, which is pretty cool. It can do both. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, Redis is in this space too. Um, the ones I think are probably the most popular and most considered are, are DynamoDB, which is very cool. Um, Redis, and, uh, React, if you guys ever heard of React before, I'm going to talk about that tonight, and, uh, and Couchbase. So within key value stores, there are really two kinds. You have in-memory caches, like Redis, and you have distributed data stores which are like the other ones. And I'm going to focus on distributed data stores today. And again, these don't care about what your data is for the most part. So you can store JSON, you can store uh, XML, binary, emojis, whatever you want. It's just content agnostic is one way to put it. It's, so it's very flexible in what you can store. If you need that flexibility, that's great. And it's usually very fast, but it's not terribly flexible for querying. So if you need rich querying, this is maybe not the right choice uh, for uh, storing or whatever data you want to put into it. So React, or React KV, I guess they call it now, has a similar thing called buckets, which is just like a uh, you know, unique key value space. And you can store key value pairs within those buckets. Um, I'm not a React user. I'm going to try to represent it fairly here. If, uh, um, if you want to know more about it, I have a friend back in Ohio, actually, who works for uh, React's company, Basho, and I can put you in touch with him if you want to get some more detail. And he can correct anything I've said wrong or have left out. He's generally a good guy to know, so if you want to get introduced, I can. Here's some more C-sharp, please. If you don't like C-sharp, just avert your eyes. Um, but uh, it's very similar. I'm connected to a React cluster. I can say, give me a client. And then to put a new object in, I would create this new React object. And this is the bucket name right here, actors. This is the key, James Bond. And then the value I'm going to put in there is Sean Connery. So I have that object that I'm going to say, put it in the bucket. All right? And that's it. And then to get it back out, I'd say, OK, client get from the actors bucket, give me the value that has James Bond as the key. This is the part I'm sure I got wrong here. but uh, in the case of C Sharp, it returns a byte array, so I've got to change that into a string to write it out to console. And so that's what I'm doing here, this whole encoding rigmarole to get this value back out. There's probably a better way, but this works, so that's what I went with. And that's what it looks like. Yeah, but there anybody using Windows here by any chance? Any? Don't be ashamed. Get those hands up high. <laughs> I am too. One of you? Okay. Uh, just a cool side note, Windows uh, anniversary update, you can now run Bash on Ubuntu in Windows in the Linux subsystem. 
React doesn't run on Windows. So I was going to do a VM, but I thought, hey, let's try out the subsystem thing and see if it works. And bam, it does. So React can run in Ubuntu on Windows. Probably not supported in production, but a pretty cool side note there. With React, though, and other databases like React, you have to think about eventual consistency. This is the gotcha with these Dynamo-style systems. So let's say I have a number of servers and a number of apps interacting with those servers, reading and writing to them at the same time. React has made the decision to not refuse writes as much as possible. So I wrote, for instance, I wrote Sean Connery as James Bond. Maybe there is a network split or a node goes down or something, and someone else says, no, James Bond is Timothy Dalton. React says, okay, I'll take that. It's fine. And then the third system says, no, it's Roger Moore. And so now we have three different rights, three different James Bonds in our React system. Uh, so maybe someone tripped over a cord, uh, but it's still going to keep tra taking those rights. That's React's goal. But in the end, there's going to be only one. So you have to resolve the conflict at some point. Um, so this is what React is sort of putting on you and says, you have to figure out these conflicts for yourself. Now, React does some cool things to help you fix those conflicts. Um, there's, some, there's some work being done for conflict-free resolution. I don't know if it were quite there yet or will ever get there, but using some maps and counters and some algebra to try to help with that. And React has some cool stuff, uh, version vectors, explicit siblings, things like that. This goes back to the cap theorem, though. Basically, React has decided to choose availability over consistency which if that's what you want, if you want it to always take a right, then this is a system for you. If you don't want to deal with conflicts though, you have to use something with, with the couch base opinion, where it's, it may refuse a right if a node is down or if there's a network split. It may say, sorry, you can't write that. There's already a document um, existing for that. So with couch base, you don't get conflicts, but you do uh, may have some problems with availability, even if it's only for maybe like 30 seconds or something. And the same goes for React, too. You may have a 30-second window where a conflict may happen. Okay. Uh, reads are still possible in both systems, right? So if you just want to get a read-only copy of a document from Couchbase, it could be replicated to other nodes, so you can still view it. You just can't write to it until that node comes back online or you do a rebalance. All right? So React scales very well, highly available, as I mentioned. Data agnostic, so you can put whatever you want in the value there. And you may have to do some extra work when it comes to resolving those conflicts. Uh, I recommend you try out React. It's very cool. If you have Windows, really easy to, to do. And I'm sure if you have Linux or Mac, also probably very easy. Uh, some use cases for key value. If you need data variability, perfect for that. Large, large object storage, also good use cases for that. Okay, so any questions on key value? Yeah, go ahead. So in the situation where you have three James Bonds, does React flag those conflicts or do you just have to try to do it yourself? That's um, a good question. Um, I, I, don't think, I don't think it's going to I think you'd have to probably in advance say how you want to handle conflicts with React or configure that. Um, because otherwise, if you try to get by key, then you have no idea what, you know, is it going to pick one at random? Is it going to give you all three? So I think you'd have to build in some conflict resolution logic there. And I think React has some tools built in to help you handle that. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be up to your app, right? Do you want to present that to the user and say, you resolve this conflict? Or can you resolve it yourself programmatically? Or some combination of those two? What is the maximum size for value? On React, I don't know. Uh, I know Couchbase, it's 20 meg for value. Meg for, for a document, yes. For React, it might be very you know, a lot larger. Uh, the reason for that is that you don't want to have you know, uh, you know, a, a gig of JSON document because that's going to be a real pain to reason about an index and things like that. So, but with React, you're not you you know you know not expecting JSON or anything, so it doesn't have to reason about what's in the document. Now, React is adding some other stuff to 
kind of improve querying and uh, indexing, things like that. But that's back to the convergence thing I was talking about earlier. Okay, cool. I hardly ever get questions about React. So that's cool, guys. I like it. All right, column there is the next one. These come from Google's Big Table paper. These are the hard ones. I find these very challenging. Um, the, the thing is here, you store data. Instead of storing it in rows, you store it in columns. It took me a long time to sort of figure out what the heck that means. Um, and I'm still not sure I understand it completely. But these are the ones you'll see if you're looking in the um, columnar, col columnar, I don't know how you say it, databases. And so if you're a web dev looking at open source tools, you're likely going to be looking at Cassandra or HBase. A very quick look here at Cassandra. These are the sorts of things, uh, the terms between Cassandra. So key spaces is kind of like a database. Uh, column families are kind of like tables. Rows are rows, but uh, they're more like key value. Well, not really key value pairs. It's, they're different. We'll see in a second. And columns are the key value pairs that are associated with a row. And so if someone's using Cassandra, how many people are using Cassandra in here? Someone mentioned it, okay. I took this uh, screenshot from the Datastax website. They're one of the vendors who do a lot of Cassandra work. And you can see up there at the top, the key space is this whole blog database. Do not use Cassandra for a blog. I don't know why. It's a, it's a cool example, but probably the worst use case for Cassandra. Here's, I just zoomed in a little bit here. So there's like the users column family. That's kind of like a table, but again, it's not really a table. Um, each row has a key. That's the blue column there, like J. Bellis and D. Hutch. So if we get J. Bellis, I'll get two columns back, name and state. And each column has a, is a key value. And this can be anything. Each row doesn't have to have the same columns at all, so it's very flexible. Um, you can do foreign keys in this, but it's kind of a manual thing, I, I guess. Um, it looks relational, but it's really a key value approach. So why in the world would you do this? So I'll, I'll tell you why Google likes it, is for analytics. And so imagine instead of a blog, you had something like, uh, like a gas meter. And you're reading from the gas meter, say, every 15 minutes, getting you know, how much gas is being used by this house, natural gas, what I'm talking about. Um, and so a column family could be a single gas meter, for instance. And um, a row could be a day. Uh, and then each column would be a 15-minute reading of that gas meter. So it would say, okay, 10, 11, 12, and so on every 15 minutes. And now, because of the way Cassandra works and the Cassandra query language works, you can get an aggregate of that data very, very quickly and get an average reading per day very fast with that kind of structure, something like that. It's very easy to do. Cassandra is great for those sorts of things. So here's an example uh, I took, from again, from datastacks.com. How to create a key space. I, just, I created one called my key space. And then it says create table. I don't know why, because it's actually a column family. But it says create table, so whatever. And then I can set up a table called users with some fields there and a primary key. And this is, looks like SQL, but it's actually called CQL, Cassandra query language. It's more like a subset of SQL. So I don't think you can do joins. I don't think you can do subqueries, some things like that. So. It looks like SQL, but it's, but it's not. Here's my, uh, again, C-sharp example with Cassandra. Kind of similar to what we had before. We're connecting to a cluster. And then I connect to a key space here. I'm executing an insert. This is all, again, from data stacks, basically. And then once I insert the user, I can get the user back out by the last name and write it to the console. Uh, it kind of looks like this. So let's say Bob35. So with Cassandra, you have this potential impedance mismatch itch issue like you do with relational. It does scale well, but I've heard from multiple sources now uh, that it can be a real problem in ops to deal with scaling and, and keeping Cassandra uh, running. So I don't have first-hand experience, but this is what I've heard about it. It is well suited to analytics, though. If you have a problem that's very much like that gas meter problem I was talking about, this is the perfect solution for that. So if your problem is like that or similar to that, then uh, Cassandra is going to be great. So metering data, uh, really big data analytics. This is why Google likes uh, Cassandra. Time series data, like 
Time, yeah, time series, kind of like that. It'll be good for storing that, so you can aggregate it quickly if you need to. Sorry. Dynamically plotting, plotting a graph. I mean, it's not a UI tool, but for storing that kind of data will make sense. Yeah, right. Okay. So speaking of graphs, how are we doing on time? I don't want to keep you guys longer than you want to be. Do graphs? <laughs> I got one in favor. It's, it's only 8 o'clock. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to stay until like 8 so. Okay. <clears throat> I'll stay as long as you guys, you know, until you kick me out, answering questions if you want to. But I don't want to keep you all hostage here, so. So are there any NoSQL databases that are storing it, storing data in non-serialized formats, yeah. excepting Bison, which does have some metadata sort of built into it? Um, I, I, I don't know for sure. I don't think there's, I mean, Couchbase documents do have some metadata on them, but it's not something that you define. Um, MarkLogic stores XML, so you may be able to store some XML schema data there. I don't know too much about that. So there also kind of seems to be like, depending on the engine that's driving it, there's kind of like an opportunity cost of serializing and deserializing the data, mm. like the format you choose. Mm. And some of them, it seems kind of interesting because you don't really have to guarantee the type. Like, I'm not sure about with, uh, um, like with Cassandra. Yeah. Uh, but with like Couchbase, I noticed you had SQL like queries, right? Query language, but maybe you're not guaranteeing the types because you don't exactly enforce the structure of the data right. on the table, right? Right. So, yeah, so there's kind of two parts to that. So you're saying you don't enforce the structure of the data when you're running the SQL queries. That's true. Uh, this is another reason why we had to add some additional stuff to the language and make it a superset. So, for instance, in a JSON document, you might have a field called first name, but you might not have a field there called first name. And so we have this concept of missing. And so it says, okay, select from the documents where first name is missing or first name is not missing. So you can query that sort of information. Um, but you're right, it is, you know, you have to think about that. Is this field going to be there? And you have to, you know, be very um, vigilant about what you're storing. You can't just put whatever you want in there and expect it to work you know, logically, right? So, you know, first name is different than first underscore name. So you have to be very, you know, disciplined about that. Uh, secondly, there are some data types, primitive ones. It is JSON, so you do have number, string, and null, and, and uh, Boolean, and all those sorts of things. So you do have some typing in there, um, which is not what you're talking about, I don't think, but I just wanted to, to mention that. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing for me is just sort of when you get large enough, if you're <coughs> letting the application control maybe a little bit of the formatting, padding, you know, the serialization format, uh, you could ultimately run into all sorts of issues. And the nice part, right, like you're using C Sharp, you've got a type of language that can give you compile type errors. And sometimes it'd be nice to have a database that can do that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, you know, that is something you definitely have to consider using NoSQL. Uh, if that is, you know, if you, you try it and that's not working, then NoSQL is probably not the right fit for that particular application. Um, you may want to stick with relational for that part and use the NoSQL for some, try, try it on something else. Or, or just hold off on it until later. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right, graphs. Graphs are, graph databases are pretty cool. Um, it's kind of the odd one out in these examples here, but it's worth mentioning. The others are just kind of just store run of the mill data, but with a graph, you're also storing data about the relationships, the rich connections between the data points. And you can kind of simulate that with the other databases, but with Graph, it's a first-class citizen. So this goes back to my boy here, Leonard Euler. And uh, he was this, uh, I don't know if you've never heard of this guy before. He's this amazing guy from the 1700s, contributed to math, physics, astronomy, logic, all kinds of stuff. And uh, I think it was probably not there, someone asked him about these bridges in a German city called Konigsberg. 
and they said, hey, I wonder if you can walk through Königsberg by crossing each bridge once and only once. And uh, you don't have to start and stop at the same spot, but cross each one of them exactly once. Now, most people would say, like, they would just try to, you know, I would just try to write, draw a line and see if it's possible. But he was like, no, I'm going to invent a whole field of study called graph theory to prove this math mathematically. And so he did that, and he created graph theory and proved that it's, uh, by the way, spoiler alert, it's not possible to do that in Konigsberg. So a graph database, this is my sort of crude illustration of the way that graph databases work. The most popular one, the only one really worth talking about, I think, is Neo4j. There are other ones out there, but this is the biggest one in the space here. So this image has some random looking things sort of spread around, and each of the items are different things. The database only really cares about these relationships between the items. And notice that these are directional as well, right? There's an arrow here. So Stormtrooper was in, Force Awakens, Stormtrooper was in, Empire. And um, this is pretty cool because you can now execute some queries on this, like, give me all the enemies of Luke Skywalker who also appeared in The Force Awakens. And the graph database can go and do that query for you and, and figure that out. So in this case, it would be, what, Stormtrooper, right? Is in Force Awakens and is an enemy of Luke Skywalker, right? But also, Darth is an enemy of Luke Skywalker, but he's not in Force Awakens. Or is he? I don't know. Um, I have to change this example after episode nine, or uh, eight, sorry. Uh, now this doesn't really have the same sort of scaling properties that the other databases have because it's really not designed for that. It's designed for solving these very interesting graphing problems. Um, so a more practical example than, than a movie is maybe like uh, give me all the people who came into my supermarket and they bought um, baby food and they also bought beer. and so. I can now find those people and maybe send them specific kinds of coupons or discounts, things like that. So it's very cool for that. Um, social networking and dating sites, because that's all about relationships. And you know, find me everybody who lives in Houston who owns a pet um, and has a, you know has properties like their age or and things like that. Right? Very cool. Fraud detection, so you can start to see outliers and you know this transaction went through here and it's way out of the norm of normal transactions so we're going to flag it see if there's any fraud there uh, routing which is obviously sort of the original thing with uh, graph theory uh, shopping which I already mentioned so that's graph very cool I don't have a code example for that one because I usually don't get this far in the in the session uh, I usually have to skip graph even though it's it's pretty darn cool all right so let me wrap up here and we'll get I'll answer your questions. Uh, like I said, I'll stay as long as you'll have me. Uh, NoSQL is a term that I have a love-hate relationship with because it's a cool little shortcut for marketing, but technically speaking, it's pretty much worthless. We talked about uh, all those there. There's other kinds of NoSQL databases like object database, which are also pretty cool, kind of similar to document databases, but also distinct. And I just want you to, when you're thinking about the design of your next application, you know, usually you go to the whiteboard and you, and you draw box arrow, box arrow, and uh, I would say, you know, think about, in reality, your application is probably going to end up more looking more like this, where you have different arrows and different boxes, and maybe SQL is right for some part and uh, no SQL is right for other parts. So think about what you're going to need long term. So you don't end up locked into the blobfish there at surface level. Couchbase has a conference coming up in November. I'm sure you're all going to hop on a plane to Santa Clara and go see it. Um, but uh, if you want to see it uh, live streamed from the comfort of your computer, you can go sign up there. Uh, also, if you sign up there, we'll send you recordings. So you don't even have to watch it live. You can just uh, see the recordings later. Those are the stickers that I used to have until all the people in Austin took them. I think I have these left and maybe one of these left. So if you want them, I'll give priority to anyone who tweeted hashtag Couchbase or uh, anyone who asked nicely. So um, this is my lovely family. They're all a bunch of shrimps. Um, but you can find us, developer community, developer advocates on those websites there. 
Um, I just, you know, I write some blog posts at blog.couchbase.com. Go check those out. If you have really tough Couchbase questions, go to the forums. Our engineers are always looking to help you there. We're on Twitter at Couchbase Dev. I'm on Twitter at mgroves. Feel free to follow up with me about anything you want. Um, Couchbase, C Sharp, uh, funny cat pictures. I, I love to have it all. So, uh, so that's all I got. So I'm happy to take as many questions and hang around as long as you guys want. But thank you very much for having me.